Hello. Oh, okay. I know you have all been here for the earlier part of the day, but I want to say welcome again to Brandywine Workshop and Archives. You're going to be experiencing, or I hope you have experienced some of another aspect of what Brandywine is. Um, and I, if not now, before there's going to be, uh, you know, some really fascinating show and tell going on on this monitor. Um, and we definitely found that people sitting further back were having a hard time seeing um, earlier. So after I go away, um, if you're up for moving forward, that would be really great. So um, my name is Matt Singer, and I've been working with Brandywine for about five years now. Um, I've been working primarily as an editor and in developing content for um, Artura.org, which is our visual arts and education resource. Um, since October, I've been working with Brandywine as director of development and communications. So it's content of a different kind and for different purposes, but we're a small group um, and we all work together. Um, so you're sitting in um, our printed image gallery, which is our main gallery space for changing exhibitions. We change exhibitions two or three times a year. Um, just for a little bit of background, um, Brandywine was founded in 1972 on Brandywine Street in the Spring Garden neighborhood here in Philadelphia. So we have nothing to do with the Brandywine River Valley and all those wonderful places, but we're a wonderful place of our own here in the city. Um, Spring Garden, or at least that particular neighborhood in which Brandywine was founded back in 1972, was largely a working class um, African American and Latinx uh, neighborhood. And Brandywine in its initial iteration was kind of, was a, a direct community service um, organization with a particular focus on um, giving young people um, in the neighborhood an opportunity to engage with art, you know, in terms of actually making art um, and to learn printmaking techniques and, you know, have an opportunity that, you know, they weren't getting otherwise. Um, but early on in Brandywine's history, um, Brandywine founded a visiting artist residency program. So while we've kept our, you know, our direct community engagement and education as a prime focus, the way that Brandywine's evolved in, you know, the five plus decades since 1972 is as a site where art is made um, by artists who are either recommended or go through an application process. We typically have about 10 or 12 visiting artists a year, so it's a very, very active program. And the visiting artists are from the local region, they're from nationwide, and they're, they're international. We actually are establishing um, residencies specifically for artists who work and live in, in Africa, um, and that's going to begin this fall, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that program. Um, so anyway, Brand Brandywine founded in 1972. The Visiting Artist Program um, was established in 1975. Since then, um, we've had about 550 visiting artists. And from those artists, we have roughly 1,400 prints. Sometimes we have problems counting them because of the nature of prints and whether a mono print is counted as something separate and additions and just so, and also it's been over a long period of time, but um, roughly those figures are correct. So, because so much art is generated here at Brandywine, um, a typical way of us working right now is for an artist who does a print to create an edition of about 50. Um, 25 of those prints are the artist's property. The artist always has, maintains copyright. Um, 25 stay with us. About three enter our permanent collection, so they can never, we always know that we're going to have these prints as resources. Um, and then the rest, Brandywine um, can sell, and we set prices in collaboration with the artists. So Brandywine is a nonprofit organization, so it's, it's a key way for us to generate money um, for Brandywine to continue doing what it, what it does. And that works on a very individual level, but also it works in a really, really wonderful institutional level. Um, Brandywine currently has 21 what we call satellite collections um, across the United States. There's one in Cuba. 
Um, the most recent to be established is at the National Gallery of Art, and it's about 150 works that they acquired. Um, so an artist who creates works at, at Brandywine has the opportunity for their work to be disseminated physically through, a, through an already established network that literally very much spans the country and definitely has international um, outposts. Um, this particular exhibition um, is drawn almost entirely from our permanent collection of prints made by visiting artists with one exception. It's called harm reduction, um, and if the term harm reduction is not familiar to you, it's, it's a public health approach that really prioritizes and extends dignity to the people who, to people who are in harm, harmful circumstances, in traumatic circumstances, and it's meant to meet them in a way that involves no judgment, just meets them with where they are, they could have substance abuse issues, they could have mental health abuse, I mean mental health issues, wherever they are, no judgment involved meeting them to help them. <clears throat> so Jessica Hammond, who you met earlier, um, who is Brandywine's collection manager and curatorial assistant, she conceived and organized this, this show. Um, so she started the show by thinking, just kind of like going through Brandywine's collections of hundreds of artworks, finding the works that resonated with her. Um, she found that it was the works that were resonating with her were images of bodies and bodies distorted um, otherwise, but typically things that kind of implied some sense of harm <clears throat> or threat. Um, as she thought about it further, she thought the focus of the show doesn't have to be bodies specifically. It, it you know, can be more about this idea of harm um, and trauma, um, particularly at this particular moment in our shared history, kind of post all the political turmoil um, of the last uh, seven, eight years, <laughs> the pandemic, um, the, uh, the various uh, social justice movements, all the things that have been happening. You know, there's been an uptick in, in violence um, you know, since starting with the pandemic, but which we're still feeling now. And Jessica lives in the Overbrook neighborhood and she was definitely seeing an uptick in, in violence in her immediate neighborhood. And it was something that was very much on her mind. So she went through the collections, she identified these works for this show, but what I want to point out to you without taking up too much time away from you experiencing Artura is just how interesting it can be to use a permanent collection and use works. It, you always have the opportunity to, to re-show works, but contextualize and interpret them in, in entirely new ways, in ways you wouldn't expect, and in ways that you often wouldn't necessarily get by just looking at a given work. Um, so I want to do this with just a couple examples, and I hope it doesn't throw off our camera people too much. Are you sure? Okay. So I'm going to move around this way first. So I'll start with this work because it's very key um, to Jessica's um, planning for the show. Um, this work is by Mo Brooker, who is, um, you know, he passed away not too long ago, but a real local luminary. Um, very prominent artist, very beloved artist. Um, it's called And Then You Just Smile. Um, you can see how rich it is with color, uh, with, with pattern, with shape. There's a, like a real kind of musical quality. There's a lot of energy to it. But Mo, in discussing the work, said that he was living in a neighborhood um, in, in which he didn't feel particularly secure. Um, and having his art to work on was a way for him to kind of structure and process his day in a way that felt safer. Um, so, so this is, is, was a, a key jumping off point for Jessica because it made that switch from this being a show in which the artworks presented depict trauma or are, are depictions of an artist thinking about trauma or historic in incidents um, 
that were harmful to art as a therapeutic um, tool. Um, I want to discuss this work quickly. It's by an artist named Kevin Cole. It's called Dreams Over Memories 3. So when you look at this work, does it bring something to mind for you? Exactly. It's a necktie. So here again, you can see a work that has, that's so lively, it's so colorful, it's, it's really fun to look at. Um, very engaging, it's a print, and yet it's very three-dimensional. It's, it's, it's really a prime expression of what Brandywine wants to do in terms of, yes, we're a printmaking center, but we want people to experiment. So it has all that going for it. But when we work with artists, we ask them to uh, produce a statement about the work that they made and also share, us, share with us a biography, and that's something we'll be circling back to in Artura. Um, but Kevin, in talking about this work, said that the, the jumping off point for this work was a conversation that he had with his grandfather when Kevin, the artist, was young, in which his grandfather was discussing how important it is to vote. And his grandfather told Kevin, who was born in, let's see, 1960, that in his grandfather's memory, he knew he had, he had witnessed experiences of black people going to vote and being lynched. And sometimes the, the implement of that lynching was the necktie that they were wearing to go vote. So you look at this work, you don't necessarily get that. Um, but it's, it's within the work. And it's, it's, all, it's all material for teaching um, because it, it presents students with, with just engaging with works in very, very different ways and ways that are very layered. Just two more works, I think. Um, this work by Maya Freelon is a signature image um, for the show. And in this work, uh, Maya, who again is another very well-established, beloved, admired artist, um, took a photo of her, of her great-grandfather um, who had served in World War I and came out of that experience with very real shell shock, what we would now call PTSD. He did receive some treatment, um, but her great-grandfather was an artist, and he continued his art studies after World War I, and I, I believe I'm getting this right, or very close to it. He was, he was the first um, director for the Philadelphia School District's art program, who was an African-American. Um, but he cited his work as an artist and his work in studying art and teaching art as very much, a, not to be too reductive, but a healing thing for him. Um, one more work that I want to point out to a degree for its content, but also to kind of represent, actually there's two more, <laughs> that uh, will kind of give you a look into what Brandywine is and what Artura is. Um, this work is called Untitled, The Dressing Table. Um, it's from 1998. It's made by an artist named Patsy Valdez, who is a really, really, really just acclaimed, legendary Chicanx artist. Um, this, this work shows a kind of home shrine, um, you know, devoted to people who, who have passed. So that's, <laughs> I don't want to say reductively that that's the entire content of this work. Um, but one thing that really made me want to mention this work is that it, out of this entire show, this is the one work that was not made by a Brandywine visiting artist. Brandywine within its collections and also in what it presents on Artura has representative collections from five other printmaking workshops. So one of those workshops is Self-Help Graphics, which is in Los Angeles, actually East Los Angeles. And it's a Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx focused um, printmaking workshop. So it, it obviously enriches what we're able to present. Um, the, the five printmaking workshops of which Brandywine and Artura have collections are similarly to Brandywine diversity driven, diversity focused um, printmaking workshops. 
so it's rich. Um, and then the final work that I want to take a moment to point out again um, is this is by John T. Scott. Um, and it's called Blues uh, for the Middle Passage One. Um, I imagine that most people here are familiar with the term Middle Passage, but I'll, I'll revisit it just in case. Um, so the Middle Passage is the route that typically went from West, West Africa to the Caribbean, um, on which you know, enslaved people were transported um, by boat. So, so that's the reference in the title. And again, in initial looking at this work, it's very colorful. Again, it's textured. It's a very unusual approach to printmaking in that it is dimensional. It involves cutouts. Um, I think you get some more foreboding sense from this work than you would have said the, you know, the ones like Mo Brooker's that I was talking about over there. But many of you might be familiar with very well-known images that are, you know, plan kind of aerial views of ships that carried enslaved people that in their diagrams show how those people were transported prone for weeks. So it was actually interesting talking about this image earlier because the way they're, the way these cutout figures are arrayed here definitely makes, definitely has that echo. But when you look closely at the images, you almost wonder if they're more contemporary figures. They are more contemporary figures. They're, they're not schematic figures. So, you know, what that does in thinking about it is that it, 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 it brings the viewer from this historic incident and this historic document um, into contemporary thought by presenting contemporary figures. Did you have a question? Or am I no, not? No. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, so all of this, you know, as you can see, we have this wonderful permanent collection. We organize. We can organize shows based on works that are created most recently. Um, we can organize, you know, monographic shows devoted to one artist or a couple artists. But we also do these thematic exhibitions, like harm reduction is. And again, like, you know, works are made. They might be exhibited once. But that doesn't mean that they're gone in any way, because we, we always revisit them. They're used in new contexts all the time. And also to bring this presentation forward, we have our artura.org resource um, for teachers and students and literally anybody who's interested. There are no barriers to, to using Artura. So by having, oops, by, by having a work in our permanent collection and on Artura, it's a way to disseminate artists' work all the time. People are, are always going to be able to access these works through our Torah. Um, and our, they're accompanied on our Torah by educational resources. We currently have a relatively small number, about 50, but we're working on ever increasing them. And John uh, Cardone will be talking more about this, but we will be having a process ongoing that isn't only Brandywine staff creating lesson plans and curriculum connections, but in, through working with teachers, having teachers kind of like complete the loop where they can create lesson plans and if they want, um, share them back to us and they, you know, go through a vetting process, but they'll become part of what our Twitter presents. All right, well, thank you everyone for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is John Cardone. So I, yes, as Matt said, I am the founder and principal of a branding and marketing consultancy called Being Design. Um, we, as part of branding and marketing and helping, our mission is to help purpose-driven organizations increase their impact through better use of technology, design, branding, and marketing. So within that bucket, we consult on a lot of different technology projects. And we do a lot of web design as part of our branding and marketing efforts. And one of the technology projects that we've worked on is our tour.org. I'm just having a slight issue getting this to come up, but it's fine. I have plenty more preamble before you need to look at anything. Um, so uh, raise of hands, who here has visited our tour.org before? OK, just a few people. Great. That's, I hoped it was zero, but thank you for looking at it. Yeah. So uh, I'll be introducing kind of the, the backstory, and then we'll get into a tour. 
So the next 90 minutes, roughly, will be broken into three segments. The first 30-minute segment is a tour followed by a Q&A, and then a short break. Uh, then we're going to go into an activity where we're going to give you all an opportunity to explore the content on our tour.org, make use of it, and to experiment with seeing what it's like to treat it as a resource. The last, then we'll maybe have a, another little break there to transition. The last segment will be just an open discussion, very lightly moderated by Matt and myself, but to hear about your experience and, and get, do some dialogue about this platform. So, what is our tour.org? Our tour.org is, as far as we can tell, it's the world's first free, completely free, online database of diverse art and artists. So what do we mean by that? Um, there are a few different online databases of fine art and visual arts. One of the most notable ones would be Art Store, which is a scholarly resource. Show of hands, who's used Art Store before? We almost everybody, so we know what that is. Uh, that's a pay-to-play thing, so you have to have an institutional license. So probably none of you have ever paid for it, but the, the institutions that you work for have an institutional license, and that's how it's funded. Not only is it institutionally licensed, it's institutionally sourced, meaning that all of the artwork, all the content on Art Store, comes from the, um, the legal holdings of various museums or other institutions, right? So it has to be owned and licensed by those institutions in order to get onto Art Store. Um, so Art Store, we'll call that kind of the legacy institutional model. There's a few other things. Um, probably the most notable right now is Artsy, artsy.net, which is for current, you know, uh, current day art. It partners with largely galleries, auction houses, other types of institutions. And it's very kind of democratized. Almost anybody can put art on there. And it's very current. Uh, and it's very good. But again, it's also primarily for the commercialization of the art and the selling of it. So again, we, we look at this and we think, well, there's a, there's a gap in between these two. There's something missing. Not only is there a gap in terms of a payment model, there's no, there's no f truly free resource. There's also a gap in what's on the platform. So something like uh, Art Store, while it does have quite a lot of contemporary art, because a lot of the museums it has do have contemporary art, if you look at the if you look at the art world as a whole, there's typically a 20-year lag at least, at least a 20-year lag between art being produced and then being collected by a collector, being donated to a museum, being digitized, and being made available on something like artstore.org. There's a few other things like Artstore, but I'm just using Artstore because it's true of all of them, right? Um, there's like a 20-year lag. And if we think about how did the work get there, typically, um, so it has to be part of a museum holding for it to get online in, in most of these major databases. And um, most museums, or pretty much all museums, the average is that they only seek out and purchase 2 to 3% of their entire collection. The other 97, 98% of their collection is donated to them by a collector, which means that any inherent bias or curation of that collector is what makes it into the largest collection, which then becomes the online database. So what we have access to online, via the art world, is largely things that are far enough in the past that they've been collected, curated, and then institutionalized, or current enough that they're put on something like artsy.net. Oddly enough, there's this enormous gap. It's about a 75-year gap between just after World War II to something about 2008 where almost nothing was digitized, almost nothing was put online. Um, there was this explosion of cultural production, right? There's more artwork and creative output in those 75 years than in all of previous human history combined, right? Post-World post -World War II Western world art creation, an enormous explosion of creative output, most of which not accessible online, not digitized. Our tour's mission is to change that. So not only do we want to start by filling in that area of time, after we, after we fill in a lot of that, area, uh, that period of time, we also have a second part of our mission, which is to look at the, un, to represent the underrepresented, right? So anyone by virtue of their class, economic status, um, ethnicity, religion and culture, any other reasons why they wouldn't have been added into the mainstream canon of art, that is appearing in Art Store, um, which again is most of the art that was created. It's not in there. 
We want to go to the places that have not yet been documented and prioritize the underrepresented art. So that's the mission of our tour.org. We want to be a free resource for that. And the final uh, form of that, we hope, is something similar to a, a variety of other relational databases that you've probably interacted with. So if anyone's looked at Wikipedia, that's a relational database. IMDB, which is the internet movie database, we've all probably looked at actors and films and previews on there. Uh, and then something like Apple Music or Spotify, which is a relational database of music, which also has a playback function so you can listen to. But as a search interface, it's a relational database. So we want this to be as accessible as Spotify or Apple Music, as information rich as IMDB, but specifically for uh, fine art. And for that period of time, first of all, but then secondly, uh, underrepresented artists. So, this is what we have so far. We've been developing this over the last three and a half years. And fortunately, we've developed it to a point where we can now have enough funding to make it a world-class app. So what you've seen here is kind of hodgepodge. There's a lot of like duct tape behind the scenes that you don't see. Uh, we know that the interface and the user experience is not, uh, not world-class in, in like standards of 2023. But over the next six months, we'll be completely redeveloping the front end of this because we finally have funding to do so. And this should look something more like iTunes or Spotify as an app and not just a website. So uh, I want to go into this and give you a tour of what's in it and, and how you can use it. So I'm going to zoom in just so that we can see this a little more clearly at the top. I'm going to walk through the navigation here. We have five core types of content on our tour.org. First of all, we have artists. So we have profiles and biographies of artists featured in the platform. And you can, find, you can get access to the artworks and any other material uh, that's related to them. Secondly, we have artworks. That's self-explanatory. At the moment, everything on this database is prints, not because it, it's limited to prints per se, but because the collections that we've digitized so far happen to be print collections. Item number three is exhibitions. So just like what the room we're si sitting in, this is an exhibition. Uh, any exhibitions that we've cataloged in the past, we've then recreated digital simulations of them. And so these could be real exhibitions that took place. They could also have been virtual exhibitions. It's essentially a group of art around a theme with some kind of uh, theoretical justification for why they're grouped. And you can read about that. So this is a way of looking at groups of images. Next, we're going to look at collections. The difference between exhibitions and collections are collections are much wider, right? So the, uh, Matt said that we've had uh, several hundred visiting artists who produced something like 1,500 works of art. That bundle of 1,500 works of art is a collection. And so we have five collections currently digitized on this database. We hope to have dozens and dozens and dozens of collections in the near future. The, the fifth content type is teaching resources, which is activating the content for a specific purpose. So this is a set of resources. And this is the newest type of content that we have here. So it's probably the least developed, most underdeveloped, I would say, is that we're trying to take the raw content of what the artists have done, their lives, their stories, the artwork that they've made, and try to activate that for an educational context. So that's combining it with different curriculum connections uh, and finding ways that we could use it in a classroom setting, maybe have activities that come out of that. Um, so we have, again, about 50 educational resources so far, but we hope to engage in a crowdsourced, um, crowdsourced process of sharing a raw resource with educators so that they can start to develop teaching materials out of that, and if they're so willing to reshare the work that they've done, and then we have a vetting and editorial process where we can make that permanently available to anyone in the world for free. And then we could have it sorted by grade level, uh, subject matter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to walk through those five types and show you how you can interact with them, search them, and browse them. I want to make just a quick highlight between browsing and searching. Those are slightly different. But in a relational database, if you, once you get comfortable, you'll do each one without thinking. Let's start by browsing. So home pages, not very useful in a relational database. Almost no one's ever going to see the home page. Typically what happens is you're going to Google, like IMDb, you Google a film. And maybe the first Google search result is the IMDb entry for the film. That's already starting to happen with Google search traffic here, where people's, people land on artist pages or artwork pages. The home page is not, not of much importance. So let's look at artists. If I click on artists right away, I'll zoom out. Uh, here we go. So if we look at artists, we're presented with a scrollable grid of artists' faces. They're inscribed in a circle. That's how you know they're a person. 
And in this view, I'm looking at 470 person results. I can sort them uh, by a variety of dimensions alphabetically, by time. I can do uh, ascending or descending sorting. But I can also filter them. So instead of just scrolling through and looking at whoever has the best smile, we can come over here and filter by, at the moment, we can filter by heritage or nationality. I'm just going to zoom in on this, go back. So um, by heritage, you can see just alphabetically, we start with African, African American. Uh, that's a typo. This, these are the same thing. Uh, Afro-Latino, Asian, Asian American. Uh, and then there's 66 more. So one of the reasons that, these, uh, that some of them seem like they overlap is because these are self-identified by the artist. We let the artist self-identify and we document. This is a descriptive database, not a prescriptive database. Uh, if I pull open heritage, there's, there are 63 heritage identifications that have already been made. So you could scroll through them or you could jump to a letter, Japanese, right? And if you clicked on that, you would then be taken to a filtered result of only the artists or the people who have identified as Japanese in their heritage. So I'm just going to hit the X on that filter and go back to an unfiltered view. So right now our two sortable dimensions, our two filterable dimensions are um, heritage and nationality. We plan on adding many more, such as uh, age or when they were born, location where they were from, uh, and so on. Let's look at an individual artist page. So I'm going to look at Betty Saar. So if I pull up an individual artist page, Pretty standard here. We have the artist's name, their bio. Uh, not a super extensive bio. We want to keep it short enough that it doesn't go on and on and you get lost in it. We want it to be short enough that you'll read it. Um, and as a rule, we try to prioritize as much of the artist's description of themselves as possible. We want to make sure that if the artist describes himself in a certain way, that most of it is coming from them. With the caveat that artists actually don't like to talk about themselves that much and they kind of like being written about. So there's a mix of that. But we, authenticity is a huge priority for us. We try to prioritize that in everything we do on our tour.org. So on the left-hand side, we have their bio. On the right-hand side, we have some basic info, a headshot, when they were born, and when and where they were born, when and where they died, if they passed away, uh, and some other attributes. Those attributes will grow over time. As we scroll down, we have different sections. We have a section for all artworks on the database by this artist. We have all exhibitions in the database that feature work by the artist. And then we have any related artists. And then we have collections featuring artwork by this artist. Again, the number of sections on the page will also probably increase over time as we have a richer uh, body of work and content to put on the site. As I said before, this is a relational database. So I can go here and click on the artwork and view that. Totally fine. I could also go here and click on an exhibition. And then I could start exploring the exhibition. And I could see all the works in it. I could also go here, see a related artist. This is her daughter, Alison Saar. Not just related by, by blood. There's relationships in terms of whether they've worked together. Or, you know, it's not related is a broad term. Um, and then uh, collections featuring. And you would see a collection page. So let's keep moving through. So if I go to artworks is the next piece. Let's look at an artwork. So this is a pretty good example here. Uh, this is a very popular piece. We have the image on the left. If you just punch on that, you get a um, what's called a light box view. So you can interact with this. You can zoom in on it. You could even rotate the piece if you wanted to, like you know, really zoom in on a specific piece. Um, soon you'll be able to log in and take notes and annotate the pieces, and all your notes will be stored in this light box on the URL where it pertained to. So. It's not shared with anybody else unless you choose to share it. But it's, it's a way for you to kind of keep tabs and note and keep record of your thoughts, reflections, or anything that you want to use in the classroom. You can keep notes directly in the platform. And then if you pull this URL up in the classroom on a projector, you can go and find the notes that you left on the piece. So that's a pretty cool tool. Uh, we don't have the logged in feature activated right now because we were waiting for funding to basically take on the responsibility of managing the security and the protection of users' data. Now that we have funding, we plan to launch that in the next six months, the logged in user experience. At the moment, it's just public view. 
So that was the image. On the right-hand side, we have the title followed by a variety of metadata. The metadata is conditional. It appears if it's relevant, and but not all pieces have the same type of metadata. Some of these are part of additions, so it has addition size. Some of them are single works. They're not part of an addition. Some of them are prints. Some of them are not. Um, so we have artist, their nationality, heritage, the medium, uh, date, dimensions, addition size, who printed it, who owns it. And then this is probably most interest is the tags. So after it gets uploaded on, into the database, we have someone go through all the content and ascribe topical tags as well as technical tags, topical and technical tags. So um, you know, the fact that it is a collage, that's a technical tag. Uh, the fact that it is um, talking about curiosity or mysticism, mystical intersectionality, those are topical tags. So the nice thing is if I click on any of these, if I click on mystical, I'll then produce a search result with any artists or objects or collections that also had the word or the tag mystical in them. So this way we can kind of explore different topical threads through the database. As I scroll down on the artwork page, there's even more information. We have a section about the work. Again, if the artist has provided any of their own words or thoughts, we put those front and center. After we get word from the artist, which is cited, we move into any maybe curators or scholarly remarks about the artist. Sorry, about the artwork. This is about the artwork. Uh, over here, we have a preview of the artist's bio taken from their bio page. You can click there to, to read the full thing. And as we scroll down, any time that a, there is a teaching resource in the database that pertains to this artwork, you'll see a button here that says View Teaching Resource or Resources. And so you can go see anywhere that this has been activated into a lesson plan or teaching resource. As we scroll down, you'll also see a section for any exhibitions featuring this artwork and any related media. So this could be an exhibition catalog. This could be um, an article written about this piece. This could be uh, a video interview with the artist. So we've covered artists and artworks. Again, if I go back to the browse view and I just click artworks, similar view as artists, I can scroll through and I can filter by who is the artist behind this object. I can filter by their heritage of the artist. I can filter by the nationality. I can filter by what collection they're a part of. And again, the number of filters will grow over time. Next up is exhibitions. So this is uh, the featured one, but we can also view other exhibitions over here. And if I were to click on it and view this as a gallery, we have this carousel that you can swipe through to look at each individual piece. There's a preview of the full data. If I click View Object, I'll go to that full page that we were just looking at about that artwork. But if I scroll down, I'll see a description of the exhibition, which is similar to this, uh, you know, this board that we have over here. This is kind of the, the, state, the curator statement. And then, of course, we have the grid so that we can look at all artworks within this exhibition. Uh, fourth up is collections. Please excuse this rather wordy intro. But um, all collections that we've digitized will be listed here. Again, this number should grow. Collections are slightly different. Um, if we look at the collection, we'll see a description of, of the justification for why this collection exists, some of its background. Uh, we'll see a preview of the artworks in it. We can start to scroll through them or hit see full collection. We can look at the artists. We can scroll through them and see all the artists. If I was to click on see full collection, it brings me back to this browse view, but with a pre-filtered view. So this is filtered for only the artworks in that collection, or only the artists in that collection. So again, you can start adding filters as you go. You can say, I want to look at this collection, but only African American artists. And then I want on, you know, maybe only ones that have a certain nationality or maybe a subject matter tag. You can filter upon filters. Uh, after collections, the last thing we have is teaching resources. So teaching resources is a slightly different interface because this is a more complex data structure. Um, as I said, we have about 50 right now. This is the most experimental thing we have on the site. This is what I would call derivative content. Everything we've looked at so far is raw content. Now we're going into derivative content. Um, at the top of the page, there are links for you to have free. You can download two free guides if you want the PDFs. But if you scroll through, you can look at individual resources or individual lesson plans that are based around one or more artworks. So if I look at this one, we, uh, Telling Many Magpies, this one is about just one artwork, which is a piece called Telling Many Magpies by Edgar Heap of Birds. 
There's a little preview of the metadata. Um, then in this about the print, this is not just copied and pasted from the artwork page. This is contextualized for a certain teaching uh, context. We have prompts for discussion. We have, again, more information about the artist, but again, written for this specific teaching context. Again, there are links to go back to the full bio, to the full object if you want. We have curriculum connections. Uh, and if there's any kind of worksheets or downloads or printouts that have been prepared for this, they are made available here. Um, and then after that, if you want to view more resources in this category, you can click there and you can, you can find more. So this is the thing that will be most developed in the future, because um, that's kind of our current endeavor. So now that we've gotten a good system for the artwork, the artists, the collections, the exhibitions, uh, the next six months will be us redeveloping the app and the interface around that. But the content team will be shifting their focus to how do we, how do we crowdsource and maintain very high quality of teaching resources. So I want to go back to the database just for a second and talk about search. So we've just been browsing and clicking on links. Search, there's this box in the top right. I'm just going to zoom in. It's always there, even on mobile view. It's not quite as powerful as Google, but it's pretty smart. All you have to do, don't think too much, just type something in. So one thing we were looking at was like maybe um, personal histories or history. So I type in history, right? I'll immediately see um, a differentiated, a kind of a, a segmented result. I'll see 64 results for people that hide either the word history in their bio or in their metadata or in a tag. I'll then see not 194 objects that had the word history in their description, metadata, or tags, or title. By clicking on this, right, I'll, I'll find, I can find out where it says history, but also very likely it's going to be one of the tags. If I then click on that tag, now I get to see, again, all other artworks that relate to the word history. So once you start exploring a topic, you can follow kind of a tag trail or a breadcrumb trail, and you can find other artists and artworks that relate to a specific topic. But you don't just have to search for topics. You could search for an image. You could say uh, snake. We have a few different pieces that have a snake in them. You could also search for a person. You could say Alan. Right here, Alan Edmond shows up as the first result because he's the most relevant. But it also shows results for six other individuals, all of whom maybe have mentioned someone named Alan in their bio. I think you get it at this point. So search, it separates them between people, objects, and maybe related media or catalogs. And if you ever want to see the full result, instead of swiping through them, instead of swiping through them, you can always just hit full results, and it'll take you back to this view. So um, search, browsing, and filtering, pretty useful. We're trying to make it even better. Uh, but there are m multiple ways that you can interact with this content.